Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Game Tentacom video, are you aboard the hype train? No, dude! That's right, because Computex is in just a few days. And we're going to be discussing quite a lot of AMD news in this particular video. AMD are promising never-seen-before hardware demonstrations at Computex, but on top of that there are rumours that we'll be seeing Vega 7NM, and we also have news on the Feng Huang APU, which is absolutely monstrous. So we're actually going to be starting with the Feng Huang first, because this thing absolutely stomps the previous Vega M GPU, uh, sorry, APUs that we've seen uh, as a collaboration between Intel and uh, AMD themselves. Now, don't forget, Intel put together that 8th series uh, Kaby Lake processors, and then we saw that combined with the Vega GPUs. But AMD are doing one better. The Feng Huan APU actually leaked thanks to a 3D Mark entry, as a lot of stuff tends to. It appears to be using some version of the Zen Plus architecture, although it has four cores, eight threads, and appears to have a base clock of just three gigahertz. This is, of course, assuming 3D Mark is indeed reading this correctly, and it's not going to be different in final retail samples. The real story here, though, is the GPU which is based on Vega. There are two things which stand out. First of all, it has 28 compute units, or NCUs technically, because it's Vega and not Polaris. So that's four NCUs higher than what you find in the Intel equivalent parts. Furthermore, the HPM2 is clocked at gargantuan speeds. It's running at 1200 megahertz. That combined with the fact it's a two stack high, so two gigabytes of HPM2 means you're looking at 307.2 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, which is absolutely bonkers. And that brings us to the fact that AMD are promising never seen before hardware demonstrations at Computex. One of the rooms that we are seeing is the fact that we will see a 7nm Vega. Now, of course, a 7nm Vega, at least from what we understand right now, is not designed for gaming in mind. Instead, it's AMD's plan to cash in on the machine learning craze. Artificial intelligence, deep learning, HPC, and that type of thing is really where Vega 7NM is supposed to shine. From what we've seen in earlier leaks, it's going to have 32 gigabytes of HPM2, which is obviously considerably higher than what their regular gaming variants of the cards would have. But the real story is because it is going to be based on a 7NM architecture, well... In theory, at least, we're going to see lower power consumption and, of course, higher clock speeds. How much higher clock speeds and lower power consumption remain to be seen, and I would be curious to see whether AMD can really ramp this up. From what the leaks have been, it's still going to have the same number of um, shaders, so it's still going to have 4096, so 64 NCU, so there's not going to be any change there. However, it is possible we will see higher clock speeds on the HPM2. Don't forget, as I just mentioned with the APU, it's running at 1200 MHz, so it's possible AMD could incorporate that type of clock speed with HPM2 inside Vega 7NM and really crank up the memory bandwidth, which definitely was a constraining factor, as I've mentioned previously with the Vega 56s. If you actually overclock the HPM2, you get a considerably better improvement than if you were to just increase the core. So in other words, even Vega 56 was constrained by the HPM2 uh, clock speed rather than the actual shader clock speed, which is just something for you to bear in mind if you do have a Vega 56 card. I'll try to remember to link our overclocking and uh, testing for the Vega 56 in this particular video. But here is where the hype train starts to build, because once again, never seen before hardware demonstrations, and that really leads the imagination to go down many different paths. I think there are a couple of really obvious ones. The fact that we're probably gonna see the Ryzen 7Es and the Ryzen 5Es. For those who don't know, they're the 45 watt versions of, let's say, the 2700. You can pretty much imagine what that means. Eight cores, 16 threads, same amount of cache as the, let's say, the, um, 2700X or the 2600X, the difference here is it's going to be operating at a much lower power envelope, which of course means lower base clocks, lower turbo clocks, but crucially you still get eight threads, uh, sorry, eight cores, 16 threads, which is still a monumental amount of power for lower power consumption devices. And let's say if you want to build a small form factor rig or whatever, it could be kind of handy for a lot of different scenarios. Let's say if you want to build a machine for, let's say, web development. Here's a pretty good one. 
You don't necessarily need an awful lot of performance, but you want to run a couple of virtual machines, you want to test out things in different scenarios, well, you know, virtual box, that type of thing, then a Ryzen 7 type, uh, base rig with that, you don't want the, you want, don't want the noise. It would be a really nice processor for that or media encoding that type of stuff as well. And the other obvious thing we're going to see is, of course, Threadripper 2. That's going to be built, of course, on the 12NM Zen Plus architecture. What are we going to be seeing here? Well, pretty obvious. Essentially identical to the Ryzen 2000 series, higher clock speeds. There's not going to be that much in terms of a difference in the actual platform from what we understand. Primarily, it's going to be a clock speed boost probably better in terms of power consumption and stuff. But you know what? That's absolutely fine with me. I would be happy to see a couple of hundred megahertz on the uh, Threadripper 2s. I don't think we're going to see increased core count by any stretch of the imagination. So for those wondering if we're going to see, let's say, a 32 core Threadripper, which means 64 threads for the 2950X, no. The rumors are that we're going to be seeing for the 2950X, for example, the same 16 cores, 32 threads, which is absolutely fine and dandy with me. The real question, however, comes from more of the gaming side of things. There's a couple of potential scenarios we could see here. The first of which is a really obvious one, some variant of Vega for gaming. Now, there's multiple different scenarios here. The first is that we could see a version of Vega, which is essentially an X2 version. What I mean here, of course, is two Vega cores Clump, clump together with some type of infinity fabric, thus increasing the sheer number of uh, shaders available. So, for example, we could have two uh, GPU blocks, which would have 64 uh, NCUs each. That, of course, is unknown. It would be rather expensive, especially because of the price of HPM2, but it's possible, particularly for, you know, um, more the professional market rather than gaming, although there are some crazy gamers out there who would be happy to pay for it. Another possibility is since we've seen, of course, the APUs now, we just saw the 28 uh, NCU version of uh, an APU, and of course, uh, uh, Intel have also been getting Vega, and there's rumors that the PlayStation 5 is going to have a Navi slash uh, Vega derivative on its GPU. It's possible AMD could release discrete versions of Navi, uh, sorry, of Vega but simply cut down the number of compute units. A great example of this is currently you've got the RX 580, which is a fine card, as I mentioned multiple times now. It's roughly fitting in the same performance echelons of the GTX 1060. But a couple of things. A, Intel uh, are going to be getting into the discrete market next year, so a uh, AMD have some breathing room, but that's still something they have to take in mind, so they don't want uh, the the mind share of the customer to be kind of thinking of, oh, what's Intel going to be releasing? But of course, the primary culprit is NVIDIA and its architecture and whatever they're going to be releasing. So the idea of them waiting, let's say, until 2019 of some point, some version of Navi, and just letting the RX 580 and the Vega 56s when there's a massive gap there. I mean, think about the gap in performance between RX, RX 580 and Vega 56. It's quite big. There's also a rather large price gap. So... Releasing a RX 590, RX 680, I don't know. In between that gap, which we have, let's say for the sake of argument, 44 NCUs. I think that that would be perfect. And it could, of course, use a different memory controller as well. And it could have a pretty decent level of performance. And it would, of course, fit in rather nicely with their gap, whether it's going to have GDDR5 or GDDR6, we just don't know. Another possibility is we could see a version of Vega, the shrunk down version, for gamers. I don't necessarily know, though, if it's going to be 7NM. I imagine it would be rather cost prohibitive, but it's possible it could be 12NM or something like that. It's a lot of different scenarios AMD have right now. Here's the thing. If you actually look at AMD's product portfolio, I, in a way, although AMD get a lot of credit, I don't think they actually get enough credit for how much they've come back on the CPU side of things. Yes, Intel are ahead in some, some areas. Primarily, you've got the single thread performance, and that's predominantly because of the clock speed, right? I mean, let's take the 2700X, which I'm currently doing uh, several videos on. Um, there's a lot of content. Actually, I run over 400 benchmarks. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. There are actually 400 and something benchmarks that I've run with the 2700X 
uh, and the 1700X, testing it in so many different scenarios, that's why it's taking so long. I think I actually come up with about 450 different benchmarks. No, I'm not kidding. So I'm putting together like uh, four or five videos, so it's a lot of work, but that's coming over the next couple of days. But let's say the 2700X. Roughly speaking, you can get it to the low four gigahertz. Let's say, you know, 4.0, 4.2, with all cores, right? The i7 8700K, never mind the eight core, which is supposedly gonna be coming along, it can hit 4.8, 5.2. Once again, of course, depending on the quality of the silicon, what cooler you're using, blah, 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 blah. So that's really where Intel have the benefit here. Pure clock speed. You know, you're looking at 20%, 30% increase in clock speed alone. I am almost certain we're gonna hear something about the 2800X. I don't necessarily think it's gonna be final specifications, but AMD are probably gonna say we're working on it. I wouldn't be surprised. They may also decide to wait on that for a future launch to keep some news back, especially if they don't feel confident yet that they can really nail those performance targets that they're, that they're uh, working on internally. What's the 2800X? Well, ultimately, let's just be honest, it's not gonna have additional cores. It's not gonna have additional cache. What it really is gonna be, of course, is premium quality silicon. So you can pretty much ascertain where you're going with that. It's probably gonna have, let's say, 200-ish megahertz on the uh, clock speeds, maybe, maybe 300, if you're doing very well. I don't think you're gonna see higher TDP or anything like that, but it is possible. I don't think they're gonna really wanna uh, crank that up any higher than what it is. As for the hype train, I'm really hoping that we see some type of information on the next generation of GPUs, whether it's Navi. And there are some rumors, of course, that we see a GPU slotted in between Vega and Navi, and Navi may be delayed, but I'm not too convinced on that, honestly. From a personal standpoint, uh, and this is a very quick overview, I think AMD have nailed the CPU side of things. Epic is doing incredibly well. They are now finding themselves in hardware vendors, which, you know, like routers and servers and whatever else that they just had never actually managed to even be on the radar of before. But now it's starting to change. And I think the single and dual socket solutions for Epic have certainly helped a lot. The 7601 chip, for example, is really good value for money. Yes, Intel certainly have the legacy they also have the fact that they've got AVX 512 support pretty much nailed down and a few other bits and pieces. And without question, the Cascade-like architecture is looking to be very impressive, particularly because it does have some machine learning um, instructions, which yes, it's not as good as let's say the V100, we did cover that yesterday, and the insanity of the HDX2, but that's not necessarily the point. Intel are not going to try and beat Nvidia or AMD on the GPU side of things for machine learning or whatever, what they can do, however, is say, hey, our processors are pretty good for this, but we can also, sorry, we're pretty good on the general scheme, but we also have the ability to do machine learning and it's better. So if you're not doing that all the time, hey, we can offer this level of performance. Instead, Intel is simply saying that with the value proposition, if you're not doing machine learning and that's not the primary focus of your task with the service and it's more incidental, then it increases the value proposition of our processor. So there is certainly that to take into account. So Cascade Lake is certainly going to be something AMD need to be cognizant of for next year. And who knows what they're going to do with the next generation of processors. We've heard everything about Starship and the sheer number of core count on that. But that's a topic for a different video. I don't necessarily think AMD are going to be ready to show that just yet. So, yeah, hype train is starting without any question. I'm going to be curious to see it and what Intel are going to be unveiling. I'm really hoping we see perhaps some information on Intel's successor to Skylake X, which once again is going to be Cascade Lake. Apparently that's going to be uh, X399, assuming that they do decide and do opt to go with that uh, naming convention, who knows at the moment. But I think that AMD are really going to want to knock it out of the park. And now investor confidence is starting to go up. AMD have on the CPU side really locked things down. The GPU side of things, however, is really where things are shaky. It's not that Nvidia have an insurmountable lead where there's no way in heck that uh, AMD can take it back. It's yes, heavily in Nvidia's favor, but it's the next round. Pascal is kind of old, as I've said many times now, it's two years old, right? 
Polaris essentially had a refresh. We had the 480 and then the 580. Honestly, I'm semi-surprised NVIDIA didn't do the same. I'm very surprised that they didn't just go with the 1180s or whatever, slightly increase the clock speeds and do whatever they needed to do, a couple of very minor tweaks, and then they re-released the cards. I'm very surprised NVIDIA didn't go that route. But hey, the 10 series was suddenly like hotcakes. They Perhaps they just didn't feel that it was worth it, right? They had the market share. As for AMD, right now they've got the 580s and the 570s and the other cards out. Vega did okay. It certainly has a lot of niche. I really like the Radeon Frontier editions. I think for developers, for people who are doing um, video encoding or you know professional work, I think it's a really good value proposition. Even the Vega 56s and 64s, they're really nice cards. And I actually still believe that the Vega 56, if you can get it at a good price, if you can uh, undervolt it and you can tweak the memory, as we've discussed ad nauseum, it's a really nice GPU, but I want to see what they've got for the next generation. And that to me is going to be paramount. I want to see their graphics card roadmap and I want to see what they've been working on. And well, with that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, subscribe, you know, ring the bell icon for the notification thing because apparently sometimes it does stuff on the YouTubes. <sighs> right, one last thing I need you to do for me. In the comments, what do you want from AMD? What would you really want to see on the GPU side of things and what you would you really like to see on the CPU side of things? And currently, what's your situation? Are you on the fence? Are you just waiting on the new graphics cards or whatever? Or have you already upgraded and you're kind of happy? Let me know. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.